right, hello everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Devin Lau, as Associate Director for Yale Center Beijing. Uh, thank you for those of you guys in China who are waking up early for this talk, um, but uh, very excited to see everybody. And um, here, at least at Yale, we've uh, officially ended classes, and so we're getting ready to head into the holiday season um, ourselves. And so this is uh, sort of a kickoff uh, holiday party of sorts. Um, for us, uh, we have a good friend of Yale Center Beijing here, uh, Paul uh, Friedman, who really needs no introduction for this crowd, but um, I will give one anyway. And uh, today we'll be talking about holiday feasts, uh, uh, looking primarily at Christmas um, this time of year um, in, in the West. And um, yeah, so I think this will be a really fun talk. And then there'll be some time for questions uh, for those of you guys who would um, like to ask questions at the end. So Professor Paul Freeman is Professor of History at Yale, uh, where he has taught since uh, 1997 and has served as the chair of the history department as well. His primary interests are uh, initially in the field of medieval European history and uh, over the course of time has uh, sort of shifted a lot of his more recent uh, interests into the history of food and cuisine and of which he's written many books and articles lately. Uh, he first, in 2007, edited Food, the History of Taste, which won a prize from the International Association of Culinary Professionals and has been translated into 10 languages. This began a series of studies about the role of food in shaping culture and historical trends. Uh, so his book, Out of the East, Spices and the Medieval Imagination, looked at the desire for spices in the Middle Ages and how it led to European exploration and conquest. And um, and then a string of books on more recent uh, trends, uh, including 10 Restaurants That Changed America, which looked at US food history, uh, including looking at Chinese cuisine uh, adapted to American tastes, um, as well as American cuisine, how it got this way, and his most recent book, Why Food Matters. Um, so very excited to have uh, a dear friend of ours uh, here again, and looking forward to uh, having a virtual holiday party of sorts here. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Paul. Thank you, Devin, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, it's going to feature a lot of peculiar food, peculiar in the sense that much of it is served only around this time of year, and peculiar because uh, these dishes have a lot of sugar. Uh, Americans like uh, uh, sweet things, um, as uh, do people in uh, uh, Britain. But um, yeah, I mean, some of the, what I'm going to show and discuss will be familiar uh, to some of you, uh, and some of these things will be uh, kind of odd. So um, really, uh, what I'm talking about is the food associated with the Christmas holidays but it's important to emphasize that these holidays have had, I mean, for a very long time, a hundred years, a gradual reduction in their religious content. That's not true for everyone, but the food associated with Christmas shouldn't be thought of in the way that say, the foods associated with cycles of the year uh, in, in China might be. These are not foods that, uh, you know, have a certain kind of rhythm or ancestral tradition. They sort of pose that way. But as we'll see, many of them have much more recent origins than people think. The important point is that people in many parts of the world, regardless of the degree to which they are practicing uh, uh, religions, uh, Christian religions, many people observe certain festive rituals associated with Christmas, uh, and food and drink are among those rituals. Um, the origin of these rituals is, in the first instance, Germany, uh, 19th century Germany. In the second instance, 19th century Britain, and particularly the writer Charles Dickens, uh, and in the third instance for much of the 20th and so far in the 21st century, the United States. Um, 
How much of these so-called traditions are real? Well, I don't think that's a constructive question because whether they really go back very far, they are deliberately archaic. In other words, the archaism I'm defining as an artificial revival of an imagined past where genuineness doesn't really matter. So Christmas food in the United States, Britain and elsewhere um, tends to be archaic in that much of it's neither as historically rooted in the past as is supposed. And that the traditions it evokes are kind of unique to Christmas. In other words, they're not features of other festi uh, festivals. So um, uh, here is a drink called eggnog, which is um, basically milk with uh, beaten eggs, a lot of sugar, and some kind of liquor, rum, uh, brandy, whiskey, and then with um, cinnamon or nutmeg grated on top of it. This is traditional in that um, in Britain and America in the 18th and 19th century, people drank a lot of uh, um, drinks that uh, involved alcohol and milk. Uh, eggnog can be warm or usually now it's served cold. Uh, this is really a descendant of drinks that we see in the 18th century called syllabubs or flips. They're a way of getting sugar and alcohol uh, together, which is a favorite kind of um, Anglo-American combination. Another, you know, old uh, tradition is um, Christmas pudding or plum pudding, as it's sometimes called. Uh, this is a sort of schematic illustration, but you have to imagine an extremely dense cake with some kind of frosting ladled over it. The cake is uh, soaked in some kind of liquor, usually brandy. Uh, it may have sat around aged for a couple of weeks or even a month. Um, it has a lot of dried fruit in it and spices. Um, again, like eggnog, this is not something that people eat any other time of year. So it's a traditional ish uh, dish. It's old, all right. I mean, it's older than say bubble tea uh, or avocado toast, but um, they even have a kind of vaguely medieval European aesthetic in that the uh, combination of spices um, the, uh, with sugar is um, uh, something that goes back to European upper class traditions as far back as the 13th century. But really they were created, these dishes and others in the um, 19th century. So uh, these archaic novelties evoke the Middle Ages, not only in their ceremonial aspects, but in the plethora of spices and exotic ingredients uh, regarded with particular favor by the medieval upper classes. And as Devin mentioned, the Middle Ages is my major research focus during my, uh, has been during my career. So the medieval aura of Christmas fair is due to a number of factors. Um, many European public festivals such as Holy Week processions in Seville really do go back to the Middle Ages. Um, and beginning about 200 years ago, so uh, I would say around 1800, it was discovered that borrowing from the medieval period provides a jolly Christmas religious patina that is in contrast to the austere solemnity of uh, Lent or Easter in the spring. M most important is that the objects and symbols of Christmas celebrations today were developed at the height of Romanticism in the early to mid 19th century. So uh, particularly Victorian England had a fondness for the medieval aesthetic, um, which is an odd accompaniment to the fact that it saw the rapid industrialization 
of England, but perhaps it's not so odd. Perhaps it is a compensatory things. But uh, architectural designs like the Houses of Parliament in London, the Tower of Big Ben, um, railroad stations were made to look like medieval buildings, medieval cathedrals. Um, so uh, whether revived or invented, Christmas foods made popular in the 19th century had to be appropriate to an overall medieval setting, even if strict accuracy would have forbidden things like turkey, the mainstay of the English Christmas dinner, which is uh, originally a new world bird and so unknown to the European Middle Ages. The medieval aesthetic is particularly noticeable with regard to sweets, gingerbread, and sometimes their gingerbread is made into you know, shapes like uh, gingerbread men, um, but it is a flat, again, spicy and sweet um, pastry. Uh, sugar dusted spiced cookies uh, uh, from Germany that are known as Pfeffernusse. Uh, a um, very dense cake with spices, almonds, and dried fruit called Panforte, that is a specialty of Tuscany. Uh, American fruit cake, which we're going to come back to. These are Swedish saffron buns known as Lusikater. Uh, so all of these things involve spices. Here, saffron, um, but uh, in uh, American fruit cake and Tuscan panforte and German pfeffernusse and so, and so forth. Uh, ginger, cinnamon, cloves, um, uh, all of this from the Middle Ages where these things were expensive, prestigious, and um, credited with medically favorable effects. Uh, marzipan is another. So marzipan is almond paste, again, with lots of sugar, and it can be shaped into little animals. Here, you know, it was just uh, marzipan shaped as if they were apricots. Uh, this is another medieval combination of sugar, honey, and ground almonds. Uh, here, associated with Christmas, but not confined just to Christmas. Uh, another uh, similar kind of product that does go back to the Middle Ages is Spanish. So in Spain, there's a product called uh, a, a sort of candy, really, called turon. And there are two kinds of turon. You see them here. Uh, the top layer and the, uh, the third layer are so uh, turon of the town of Gijona. Uh, and um, the ones with the nuts showing through is turon from the city of uh, Alicante. So Turon de Alicante looks like Italian nougat, um, uh, the soft crumbly Turon de Gijona is unique to Spain. These, um, interestingly enough, reflect the influence of Islamic confectionery traditions, which were very influential since Spain was uh, Muslim for uh, centuries. So uh, in Spain, uh, Turons and Marzipan are uh, are popular. In some cases, there are dishes associated with Christmas that have medieval antecedents, uh, uh, particularly as banquet cuisine. So um, here you see a boar's head. And um, when I was growing up, nobody, I didn't believe that people actually ate this. Uh, uh, you know, it was sort of like a symbol and you heard about it. But indeed, uh, uh, boar's heads are a medieval feast dish. Here you see a reconstruction of one glazed on one side, the side closest to us with some kind of green parsley sauce on the other side covered with gold foil and um, a yellow sauce. So um, this is according to a recipe from a 15th century cookbook uh, made by the chef to the Duke of Savoy in the Alps. Uh, one of the Oxford colleges, Queen's College, has a boar's head dinner, which supposedly commemorates the miraculous deliverance of a late medieval undergraduate 
attacked by a wild boar while walking and reading. Um, somehow he managed to kill the boar with his copy of Aristotle. Truly miraculous. So this feast dates from the 14th century. It's celebrated at Christmas time, although not precisely on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve uh, itself. And um, this, as well as some confusion over some of the things I've shown you, like Turon, brings us to the important but confusing aspect of Christmas food and drink. That celebrating Christmas is not limited to the day, December 25th. In some countries, Twelfth Night, which is the eve of Epiphany, is or was until recent, recently more important than Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. Um, and even with the compression of the holiday to December 24th, December 26th, there are distinctions not only among nations, but within them. So in Britain, it's generally agreed that Christmas dinner is on December 25th, and it takes place in the afternoon or evening. But in the United States, Christmas Eve is usually more important, particularly among immigrants or descendants of immigrants from Catholic countries like Italy. Or Christmas morning is important because of the opening of presents. Now, this may be then the setting for the consumption of traditional foods. For the many sweet pastries, candies, and drinks that accompany the holiday, the days leading up to Christmas are more important uh, than the day itself. So for example, during Advent, which is the uh, uh, weeks before Christmas, so we are now in Advent. Mulled wine, Christmas cookies, and gingerbread are repeatedly brought out at parties or family gatherings. Mulled wine is, again, a kind of neo-medieval taste. It's wine warmed up, so you see it's in a pot, with um, fruit slices uh, and spices, particularly sticks of cinnamon. So um, the Swedish tradition that I showed you before, these uh, buns called lusikater, are uh, prepared in Sweden for St. Lucy's Day, which is December 13th, but they are regarded as a uh, Christmas uh, tradition. In the English-speaking world, Twelfth Night lost its importance long ago. And the Christmas holiday basically ends with New Year's Day. In countries such as Spain, however, the influence of American commercialization uh, has weakened what until recently was a very different system, where the Dia de los Reyes, um, uh, Epiphany, the day in which the three kings were supposed to have uh, found Christ, uh, was the major holiday. So when Epiphany or Twelfth Night was the most important holiday. The Christmas season led up to a time of rowdy festivity. Eating and drinking were deliberately excessive. Um, and, uh, you know, it's thought that this has something to do with winter, with a kind of uh, gastronomic reaffirmation that you're alive, even though it's dark much of the time. The English and the New World Puritans, so the people who first settled uh, the northeastern area of the present United States, religious Protestant refugees, they disapproved of all but the most perfunctory Christmas observance. They objected in particular to this kind of mob celebration, regarding it as typically pagan uh, and as Catholic in its materiality its idolatry and its excess. Um, uh, if the laws of the Puritan Commonwealth and of New England states like Connecticut at what time uh, legislated against Christmas revels, um, they were by and large impossible to enforce. But nevertheless, these Protestants succeeded in quelling Twelfth Night. Henceforth, um, and by henceforth, I mean really after the restoration of the British monarchy in 1660, feasting would center more or less around the nativity around December 25th. 
uh, more or less because it depends on the country. So unlike American Thanksgiving or Russian Easter, there isn't in most places a single meal that defines the Christmas season's culinary repertoire. Some of this is due to the fact that the Christmas holiday goes uh, over a period of days or weeks. Some is the result of changing the holiday, as I've just said, from a boisterous adult occasion of feasting into a domestic child-centered event. This is um, uh, the context for the emergence of Santa Claus, uh, a figure uh, uh, for children. So um, insofar as this holiday has become much more children-centered, so instead of adults kind of uh, carousing, it's children opening their presents in the morning in a kind of, um, uh, you know, a period of the day completely unsuitable for raucous or even excessive dining. So um, Advent now focuses on the Christmas payoff in terms of gifts, but it initiates culinary events with all of these cakes, candies, uh, sweet biscuits that I've tried to um, uh, uh, show you. The child-oriented Christmas means overall less drinking, although, you know, the eggnog and the mulled wine are, um, I mean, it's rather hard to get drunk on eggnog or mulled wine. Unlike most secular feasts, Christmas dinner is not an appropriate occasion for pleasant inebriation, or at least not conventionally. Uh, as I said, all of these seasonal drinks like Swedish glug, American eggnog, or malt wine um, do not serve as pathways to any kind of excess. With this context of a decentralized Christmas food and drink repertoire, um, I could turn to some specific specialties and specific practices. Generally speaking, the appearance of long-standing traditions and codifications uh, are strongest in Northern Europe, while eccentricity and recent changes are characteristic of the Southern Hemisphere. So um, keep in mind that in the Southern Hemisphere, um, the seasons are reversed, at least their, their names are reversed. So what is winter north of the equator is hot and summery. Um, so uh, in um, uh, Argentina, the, um, uh, the holiday is celebrated with um, uh, an Italian, um, got this a little bit out of order. Yeah, an Italian dish called Vitello Tonato. This is like the quintessential Christmas dough. Uh, in, this is a very thinly sliced veal with a cream sauce flavored with um, uh, tuna fish. So it, it, it's called Vitello Tonato in Italian, uh, but in um, uh, Argentinian Spanish, it's just uh, 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 Vitello uh, uh, Tonato. And other countries have, um, you know, odd kinds of specialties. So uh, in Japan, the dish most associated with Christmas is Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, followed by a kind of sponge cake uh, made with strawberries. This is not a new, uh, you know, not an age-old custom. Obviously, it dates from the 1970s, uh, and it's exa an example of. Um, enjoying something that's readily available all year round. Obviously, Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, is not associated with just one time of year in the way that Christmas pudding is. Also, uh, the uh, chicken and that sponge cake are free of any pseudo medieval associations. Um, Thinking about, you know, what, what are the special dishes of Christmas, I looked at an online list uh, of no less than 30 dishes for the UK uh, that are associated with Christmas, ranging from a kind of raisin cake, 
uh, called Dundee cake to things found at other times of year, such as trifle, um, which is a kind of uh, cake in uh, a uh, liquor and cream sauce with fruit uh, or beef wellington, or um, these are devils on horseback, which is a kind of savory or appetizer, uh, and they're prunes uh, cooked and wrapped in bacon. Such diversity notwithstanding, Britain is actually exceptional because there's substantial agreement as to when the celebratory meal takes place and what has to be included. Christmas dinner is served on the 25th in the early afternoon uh, or evening, and it features roast turkey or goose, roast potatoes, Brussels sprouts, Christmas puddings, and mince pies, and maybe uh, a few sausages wrapped in bacon. So sausages wrapped in bacon are similar to what we see here. Um, as with so many aspects of Christmas, Charles Dickens can be credited or blamed for what are now regarded as age old Christmas foods and ceremonies. His book, A Christmas Carol, published in 1843, actually mentions two meals. Um, one is a meager but nevertheless joyous Christmas Eve feast that Bob Cratchit and his family managed to put together with their own resources and then uh, the immense turkey furnished by Ebenezer Scrooge's newfound largesse. Ebenezer Scrooge, who has been a miser and uh, has held Christmas in contempt, uh, has a kind of visitation from the ghost of his partner. And um, in typically marginally believable Dickensian fashion, becomes a good guy after that. Uh, turkey had a long history of presence at the English Christmas table, even before Dickens. A book called uh, 500 Points of Good Husbandry, published as far back as 1573, uh, includes turkey along with various meats, uh, brawn, which is um, sort of animal organ meat, uh, pudding, uh, souse, another kind of uh, sausage-like preparation made with organ meat, and minced pies, as typical of Christmas. By 1727, turkey was so frequently uh, associated with Christmas that the well-known poet and dramatist John Gay could observe that, quote, from low peasant to the Lord, the turkey smokes on every board. Nevertheless, goose and turkey remained less expensive, goose and chicken remained less expensive than turkey, and it was only in the aftermath of Dickens' Christmas Carol that uh, turkey uh, became almost required. And here again, turkey is not a regular item in uh, 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 England. It's really almost exclusively, but also required at Christmas. So currently in the UK, surveys show that between 76 and 87% of families eat roast, eat roast turkey on Christmas Day, um, which is an index of conformity that very few nations can rival. Christmas pudding is also uh, uh, because of Dickens. Uh, the fact that it's sometimes set on fire, the fact that there's a holly sprig on top is, um, you know, is from Dickens and is a 19th century uh, 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 creation. Um, it is often made without plums. Uh, it is not a pudding in the sense of being a, a kind of um, gelatinous texture. It's a very dense and solid cake. Uh, and what it really actually resembles are certain kinds of confections that are associated with the Arab, Persian, and Turkish world. Nevertheless, by the 18th century, um, uh, uh, this was uh, this was served in England uh, all the time as the standard uh, finish to a Christmas meal. And um, again, this is something that is surrounded by a lot of ritual. Um, it's uh, prepared uh, often, uh, as I said, months in advance. Uh, each member of the family might stir the batter. Um, 
clockwise, not counterclockwise, uh, and make a New Year's wish. Uh, and it is periodically fortified with brandy or whiskey until it is finally unveiled and sometimes set afire uh, on Christmas Day, soaked once more in liquor and then set on fire. So Christmas, the one day of the year when everyone in Britain eats pretty much the same thing, exalts what might be called bland abundance and predictability. And noting this, uh, an English professor and a well-known crime writer named Ian Samson summarizes the meal in its English form as, quote, pathetic, good enough, resistant to change, Christmas on a plate. Um, and this seems a little harsh to me. But let's turn to the United States. So uh, the United States at first imitated Britain and Dickens' Christmas Carol again transformed and really foregrounded what had been an unimportant holiday before. Uh, before Dickens, uh, not only was it Puritan disapproval, but um, really New Year's Eve and New Year's Day were the main seasonal holiday. Uh, this was because the United States was founded as a secular nation, kind of hard to believe now, but um, uh, the stores were often open at Christmas. Um, it was um, uh, a, a holiday, but a sort of a half holiday. The part of the country that really exalted Christmas first was the South, partly because they thought they were imitating England, partly because they made it the one day of the year where the slaves were given uh, uh, you know, a nice meal. Uh, they had an image of their culture as um, cheerful and hierarchical, as opposed to the dour business-like atmosphere of the North. So that the South deliberately imitated the um, practices of what they saw as the medieval or Elizabethan past. Um, in 1874, the celebrated Massachusetts religious leader, Henry Ward Beecher, recalled that when he was young, Christmas had seemed alien, a holiday observed by Catholics. Uh, but by 1874, uh, most of the country under the influence of Dickens uh, and also uh, the writer Washington Irving, who was the first kind of internationally famous American writer uh, who also wrote about Christmas, um, uh, Christmas had become sort of established as a major holiday. But unlike Britain, there was no set menu and not even a set time to celebrate Christmas. Ham might be preferred to turkey. Plum pudding might be served, but uh, uh, maybe pumpkin pie. Uh, or the French uh, bouche de Noël, uh, a chocolate um, kind of layer cake uh, made in the shape of a log. So bouche uh, meaning log, uh, and it's, you know, covered with brown frosting to look like a large piece of wood. Um, insofar as there was going to be a large familial dinner on Christmas Day, it would center around Turkey, given the influence of A Christmas Carol. The problem for the United States is that people had already had Turkey for Thanksgiving, um, a national holiday celebrated on the last Thursday of November. So Thanksgiving, you know, you have to have turkey in the way that you have to have plum pudding in Britain. And it's just a month before Christmas. So in theory, nothing prevents you from having turkey again. Month has passed. Um, but to do so compromises its uniqueness. There is something odd about two similar, mildly religious, but essentially secular cold weather holidays with the same main course. This is really a problem in the United States. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's our biggest uh, uh, challenge uh, facing us now, but my, I wasn't asked to talk about other challenges. I was asked to talk about uh, holiday food. So um, Christmas was associated with Turkey in this country from the 1840s until about 1900. 
And um, beginning in the 1890s, magazines uh, and other opinion shapers suggested substituting something else. Um, venison, that is deer meat, or a crown roast of pork, uh, or even uh, I've seen one case where they suggest serving veal curry. As part of the triumphs of appearance over taste that marks much of the early 20th century American scene, um, magazines offered stylish ways to incorporate red and green colors of Christmas or to create lighter innovations, such as a Christmas pear salad, furthering, again, the um, confusion over what the traditional meal was supposed to be. Um, and in the 20th century, Christmas started to become its own satire. The food most associated with comedy and Christmas is fruitcake. Fruitcake is a lot like plum pudding. It's cake, but it's very dense. It's been soaked in alcohol. It has lots and lots of dried fruit. For most of the world, um, the taste would be uh, unpleasantly sweet. Uh, the quantity of sugar um, uh, in, in this is quite extraordinary. But um, fruitcake comes in from amused contempt. There's a widely diffused uh, joke or belief that really there's only one fruitcake in the United States, but that people keep on giving it to other people. And it's true. Often you will get fruitcake as a gift, say, um, you know, if you're a doctor, you get a fruitcake from grateful patients and people can send fruitcakes by mail. And one's response to getting fruitcake is often to see if there's somebody else you can give it to. So like somebody who, um, uh, you know, uh, works in your building, uh, like the, the doorman or somebody like that. Um, it's unclear that anybody actually likes it, wants to keep it or wants to eat it. Often you see uh, this time of year features in newspapers and magazines that go, actually fruitcake doesn't have to be unpleasant. Or uh, yes, you could actually make fruitcake that tastes good. Or here is a recipe for real, italicize the word real fruitcake. So uh, the result is that the United States has a kind of pick and choose repertoire of possibilities for Christmas in regard to timing and with regard to particular dishes. The most durable food traditions are small items, little cookies, candy canes, um, eggnog. Uh, a food writer named Kathy Kaufman noted, unlike our colonial ancestors, contemporary Americans think Christmas dinner very important but we just, we can't predict the menu. Uh, Thanksgiving functions as a form of civic unification, much as does British Christmas. It has a very predictable set of dishes, but Christmas can express a variety of class and ethnic identities, as well as quirky personal decisions. My in-laws uh, used to prepare a Christmas day breakfast uh, that featured stolen, uh, which is a German kind of um, uh, uh, cake with raisins again and covered with powdered sugar uh, and also uh, Canadian bacon. So the breakfast was bacon and stolen and, and that's what they served every uh, Christmas. And, and that was their only unchanging Christmas meal. They might have other festive meals during Christmas, but this was the breakfast was the one that didn't change. Um, uh, so Dresden uh, is the city that is associated with Stalin, uh, Dresden or Stalin. Um, and Germany is, I said at the beginning, is the home or the point of origin for Christmas in, uh, in uh, many respects. But um, uh, other countries, uh, as I said, have uh, responded in different ways to these traditions. 
So um, the Vitello Tonato that I mentioned before in Argentina, um, uh, Australia for a long time celebrated an English Christmas because Australia saw itself uh, as England, even though um, plum pudding is really not good in the middle of summer, a little on the kind of hearty, dense and sweet side. Um, but as part of its movement away from cultural dependence on Britain, Australia now has um, um, outdoor cooking for Christmas, things like barbecued prawns. Uh, in other places, such as in Scandinavian nations, uh, the pattern of something eaten only on Christmas that used to be all the time is repeated. So just like turkey in Britain is eaten only on Christmas, but it used to be a kind of a festive dish or boar's head in such archaic places as um, Oxford colleges used to be served at other feasts. So this kind of gelatinous fish, um, uh, usually cod, uh, bathed in lye and water over a period of weeks. It's called uh, lutefisk, as you see. Um, uh, this is something that foreigners find not only um, uh, not good, but really repellent and almost nauseating. Uh, it's become, as you see the little Swedish flag in there, uh, a marker of identification, but it is associated particularly with Christmas. So um, uh, in fact, until the recent revival of Lutefisk in Sweden, uh, they'd forgotten about it. This is really, I'm closing with this because here is an example of archaism. That is, you bring up something from the past and say, this is our tradition. Um, uh, people don't actually necessarily like it, but it, it gives you a sort of, I don't know, a sense of belonging. Um, so uh, really I would end with uh, this uh, uh, remark that I began with, that essentially we're dealing with something that is um, uh, not so much old as it feels old. It validates a tradition that is not religious, not national, not family, but some combination of all of those. So uh, as uh, Devin said, I'd be glad to entertain questions or comments. Um, and uh, let me also wish you uh, uh, all the best for the end of the year and um, uh, the, uh, the beginning of a new one. Great, so if people have questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or um, type it in the chat box. Um, and uh, we can we can just have a nice, friendly time to discuss. Um, thank you, Professor. I really enjoyed your talk on Christmas foods. I have a question like, um, what are some significant um, connections between that you see between like Chinese holidays? that are similar to Christmas holidays? Um, well, you tell me. I mean, uh, what Chinese holidays would be similar? Uh, I, I think seasonal uh, aspects, which as I understand it are very important uh, uh, in um, certain Chinese festivals. Oh yeah, I think I was um, talking about like Chinese New Year, which I think is um, really similar to Christmas? Yes. So I think, um, as I understand it, the sort of um, uh, celebration that I mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, having a kind of slightly rowdy atmosphere, um, setting off fireworks, or, um, uh, uh, you know, having parades is kind of like Christmas was a couple hundred years ago. What I wonder is if Chinese New Year is as family-centered as Christmas has become. 
in uh, uh, the United States and in Britain. In other words, do people, uh, there are, you know, what holidays are celebrated um, uh, kind of like uh, publicly, uh, where you go and do something outside, or you perform certain kinds of, you know, you, you go on parades or watch other people, and which holidays are just celebrated in the family? What's happened in um, uh, a lot of the United States and Britain, but less in places like Spain and Italy, is that holidays that were formerly celebrated sort of by an entire village or neighborhood uh, are more, um, yeah, more family-centered, more isolated. Thank you, Reina. Um, anybody else have any questions? Or if anybody also wants to comment about comparing Chinese holidays with uh, Christmas and other similar holidays in the West? What, what I wonder is if in China there is the same, I mean, there's an undercurrent of attitudes in the United States and Britain that uh, these holidays are not fun. Uh, uh, Officially, you're not supposed to say that, but in fact, it's all over newspapers and magazines that people get depressed during the holidays because you're supposed to be happy, but they're not. Or that um, the holidays are when you discover just how badly your family gets along. Uh, that um, you realize that you, you know, are relieved when the holidays are over uh, because it's a lot of work. Um, I don't think that this is something that people like to boast about, uh, uh, but it is such a feature of the media. I don't know if Devin uh, uh, agrees with me, but it, it is, uh, you know, so often, even though the holidays are designed, I mean, the media is designed to make you uh, spend money and feel good about the holidays. Um, it sort of takes back with the other hand and points out how, uh, many period, people experience the period as dreadful. <laughs> I, yeah, I wonder if that's true in, in China. I suspect not, but perhaps I'm romanticizing. I mean, I, I would love to hear if, if other people have, have thoughts. Certainly, I think uh, a lot of the traditions are changing. Um, and, you know, I, I hear often of people nostalgically saying it's not the same as, you know, Chinese New Year is not the same as it was. Uh, back then and you know there's not as much of an emphasis and maybe people are more interested in traveling uh, instead of actually getting together with family right 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 this I, I spent a lot of time in Spain for my research and um, you know holy week as it's called which is the week before Easter um, which used to be marked by religious observance beginning in the 1970s, both because of affluence and the um, decreasing in piety, uh, Holy Week became a time to travel. And so you would see travel agencies with, uh, um, you know, advertisements in them for, uh, you know, going to um, Sri Lanka for your uh, uh, Samana Santa for the Holy Week or, um, you know, going to uh, Sardinia or, uh, Tunisia or the United States or wherever. Uh, but the idea that far from uh, family observance, religious observance, you know, you just go to some resort. Um, yeah, that certainly changes. Things. Um, I, I was curious to hear how so much of the foods are so heavily spiced and sugared, which is something we've sort of tracked from medieval times, um, I, I just I'm just curious if there are any other sort of noticeable reasons that you can think of for why that may be true. Um, I think it is, as I said, uh, uh, a kind of combination of German and British uh, romanticism. So uh, the way the Christmas holiday is um, shaped 
uh, in the 19th century uh, coincides with the maximum influence of the Romantic idea of the Middle Ages, not only as a religious period, uh, but as a period of gallantry, celebration, um, the antithesis of industrial society. So uh, you try to evoke um, a medieval atmosphere uh, because it's festive as opposed to going to the factory or going to the office or you know, later getting into your car or uh, getting into the bus or the metro uh, to go to work. Um, and so it's a bit of a, a, a fantasy, but one that's based on a perceived tradition. And so the food conforms to that. Yeah, and that sort of, you know, another thing we talk a lot about is the role of nostalgia in, in food, um, not just holiday foods, but just in general about how a lot of the food traditions we actually have aren't actually that old, but they we sort of attribute them to being older than they are, um, you know, to, to, to sort of have the sense of the good old days. Um, can you, I think, and that I think would be something that may be similar across cultures is, is sort of this role that nostalgia and perhaps false food memories may have uh, in, in holiday celebrations. Yeah. So um, in order for nostalgia to work, it's best if it's the food is something that you only um, uh, eat then. So uh, I think in China, uh, um, obviously varies from region to region, there are a number of dishes that are associated with you know one particular time of year so that is certainly a way of um yeah of uh, of having uh, uh that nostalgia uh, in the foreground so there's a question in the chat of how has christmas food changed or developed over the course of time um yeah what differences can be found between modern Christmas foods and traditional foods. So um, we now go to the house of some people on Christmas day who serve goose. And goose is something that used to be um, uh, very widespread. Uh, and it's mentioned in fact in um, uh, uh, Dickens' Christmas Carol. Uh, but, um, it's uh, tedious to cook and um, hard to find. And so this would have been, this is an example of something that was very common, say, you know, 1850, 1870, um, and replaced largely by Turkey or Turkey itself, as I said, after 1900 uh, uh, was replaced. Um, American Christmas has become less like British Christmas as time has gone on. So um, in 1850 or 1870, you'd have Christmas pudding that was exactly like English plum pudding. Now, um, I have been to Christmas celebrations where people have had it, but it's always been something that they bought. I don't think I've ever had actually uh, plum pudding that people made. Uh, uh, for Christmas in the United States. Uh, so the major tendency is for the canonical food to have been replaced by a kind of repertoire of possibilities. Uh, so that's, I guess, the point I was trying to make with regard to my in-laws uh, featuring Canadian bacon and uh, stolen. So the stolen is a Christmas food, but not necessarily for the day of Christmas. Uh, the Canadian bacon, I don't know where that comes from. And um, uh, as many of you will have experienced, um, there are all sorts of questions now you'd like to ask your parents, but it's too late. Yeah. Um, I mean, it reminds me of how many Chinese American households for Thanksgiving instead of turkey we'll have roast duck and instead of stuffing we'll have fried rice um and you know these things are malleable when when you're in in 
a country and, and a food tradition that's known for having choices uh, more so than for for specific quality of food. And also in a country whose food is maybe alien, but really alien at the time. I mean, Thanksgiving food, there's, there's, there's no immigrant group to the United States or well-represented immigrant group that immediately likes Thanksgiving food. <laughs> Oh, and that doesn't find it horrific. Uh, looks like we have another hand up. Uh, hello, Professor. Thanks for your sharing. Talking about the Christmas put Christmas pudding, I heard that uh, people put coins in Christmas Christmas pudding. Is that true? It's interesting that in China we also put coins in dumplings during spring festivals. I want to know what this tradition what this tradition comes from in the West. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, uh, good. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, there is, for example, in New Orleans, a thing called a king cake, um, uh, which will have uh, uh, some prize or coin in part of it. Um, and um, you do see this sometimes with uh, puddings or pies. And I think it's the same idea as in the dumplings that you described. Um, uh, luck, uh, luck for the new year, rather than luck associated with Christmas as a religious holiday. Um, but, you know, religion, the supernatural, uh, the desire for luck, uh, and the recognition that it's not, um, you know, apportioned out everywhere. In other words, luck is something that um, uh, you try to seek out and guard jealously if you find it, because there's not a great surplus of it. So yes, very similar uh, kind of uh, uh, mental focus for those. Um, the fact that they're in dumplings in China, I think um, shows that the Chinese taste for sweet items like cakes, cookies, and so forth is not perhaps as well developed uh, or crazy, uh, to put it a little more bluntly, as um, in the United States and Britain, as Devin knows, uh, and many of you I'm sure will have had this experience too. Um, uh, by this time in December, you know, you've, you've already just uh, been offered so many uh, uh, cookies, cakes, um, things that are just dense with sugar, and, you know, there's still several weeks to go. Yes, and that, of course, plays into another holiday tradition of New Year's resolutions that don't get New Year's resolutions to, <laughs> right, to lose weight because it's uh, uh, it's it's very hard to avoid. Right. Um, I, I'm curious about about goose and and why has that fallen out of favor in in the U.S. Um, I mean that seems like such a better option than turkey. Um, the meat is dark. Uh, most Americans like white meat. Uh, and the turkeys are bred to have, and, and chickens too, for that matter, uh, you know, huge breasts and uh, huge amounts of white meat. Um, a goose produces a lot of fat, even more than duck. So it, um, it you know, it's not that turkey is particularly healthful, but goose seems like it's just a, a, a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I I like it a lot um, and when we have it at these people's house, but I'm glad that they cook it and I'm never tempted to try it myself. I mean, another aspect of both Thanksgiving and Christmas in the United States is that um, people, first of all, people don't cook at home that much. Secondly, they don't use their ovens very much. They don't roast meat anymore. That used to be something that in my childhood, you know, if you went to people's houses for dinner, they would they would they would roast something for dinner because that was sort of like a, a demonstration of seriousness about serving you something. Um, many people don't even really know how to light their oven, so that there are helplines for people who have can't figure out how to roast their turkey. And the helplines start out with people who are, you know, can't remember how to light their oven uh, or whose oven they haven't used in a long time. And it's, um, 
uh, most of the ovens in this country have a system where uh, a, a, a small flame comes on and then uh, it ignites a larger one. And uh, often that uh, ignition doesn't work, particularly if you haven't used it in a long time. So people have this, you know, uh, justifiable panic because they have 10 people coming over and, and their oven isn't working. But the reason their oven isn't working is that they haven't used it since last Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yeah, um, it reminds me of a chef who, who, who always says, well, you know, why, why are the uh, people cooking the biggest meal of the year one time a year and that's it? Like, why would you not call in the professionals <laughs> to do that? That would be the one time when, yeah, yeah, when it would be best to just go out uh, in theory. But it's, um, you know, it's like, um, I, I, I don't know, you could, uh, uh, you, you want to show that you can run the marathon, but you haven't actually trained for it. Right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Professor Friedman, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for waking up early for this. Uh, thank you, oh, everybody. It's great to see you. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, we do. Andy has another hand raised. Would you would you like to answer one more question? Sure. All right. We'll, we'll make this the last one. Hi, hi, Professor. Yeah, thanks very much for, for sharing, you know, the, the interesting histories. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, maybe you already mentioned this, but um, I guess in general, like, we, you know, the people in the East are, I guess, less, um, you know, addictive to sweets or, you know, kind of uh, sweet food or desserts. So it's, it's common that, you know, when we travel to the West or, you know, maybe in the Middle East, people, you know, the level of acceptance in terms of uh, sweet food is, is, really, is really high. And, you know, in general, those foods are kind of too, too sweet for us. You know, do you think there's a maybe like an economic uh, reason for that, you know, in terms of the, you know, the history of sugar or anything like that? I think it really is a matter of taste. So, um, because there are some things like meat. So as China has become economically more prosperous, the amount of meat consumed has increased dramatically. But I don't think that the amount of sugar has. Um, and you see it in things like tea. So, you know, tea, which was invented in China, in much of the rest of the world, people drink with sugar. So most people in Britain, which is, you know, a, a, a country with a lot of tea drinking, um, put milk and or sugar uh, in their tea. Um, in the Middle East, uh, often tea is uh, uh, drunk with uh, sugar, coffee as well. Uh, so um, I, I just think that, I don't think it's a, like a uh, biological, genetic, uh, um, uh, but it's a very strong cultural preference, and it, um, uh, yeah, it's quite it's quite remarkable. Uh, I think the experience of traveling, of growing up in China, and then just seeing how much sugar the rest of the world thinks uh, is desirable, and and the way people rhapsodize about, uh, you know, ice cream or chocolate cake, or you know, joke about how. Uh, 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 how tempting it is. Things that, you know, even I, I don't have actually uh, a, a love of uh, a sweet things uh, commensurate with my culture. Um, and so I often, oh God, do I really have to eat this? Or are you serious? Are you going, are you going to eat that uh, huge slab of chocolate cake and with ice cream and then put some sort of sweet syrup on the ice cream so yeah i think i think i think it's really cultural and not and not economic yeah uh, very interesting thank you professor thank you all right well thank you everybody again for joining us um and thank you professor friedman as always for a wonderful discussion 
Um, if you if you guys know either myself or uh, Professor Freeman, you'll know that we can talk about food forever. So, yeah. um, but uh, uh, hopefully, I look forward hopefully. to having a meal with you soon, uh, Devin. Exactly. Thank you for inviting exactly. me. All right, thank you, everybody, and I will unmute everybody um, so that they can thank you as well. Thank you so much. Have a happy thank you, holiday. Professor. Thanks, you Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.